Shalom and welcome to Wisdom in Torah Ministries. My name is Rico Cortez. I'm so happy to be here with you again, sharing some of the stuff that I'm learning. Recently, I made a post. I made a post about verses in which shows that the Father re resurrected Yeshua. Immediately, there was a little controversy, and, and I don't mind the disagreement. It's okay. I don't know how you cannot disagree. I don't understand how you cannot agree that the Father resurrected Yeshua, but that's another topic. And it got to the point that it was like challenging my beliefs when, in fact, I'm trying to state facts on the Bible. So there are times, and one of the things that you do when you study the scholarly world, there's peer review, and there are different types of things that are taught, and they have conversations. They they write their stuff, and they have dialogues. And, you know, we I think that as believers, we must and should also develop the thick skin to have a conversation about certain topics that are not comfortable, uh, whether it is because of our belief system or because the way we feel we have truth. And one of the things that I do every day is study. And as I study, I, re I realize how much I really do not know. One word in the Greek or the Hebrew, and one word in the Hebrew and the Hebrew connected in the Greek and re-Hebrew connected with a cultural background or temple function can change the whole narrative. And and that happens a lot. So I want to take the time to really go through every verse. And I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And, and, and it is important that we recognize there are certain things in scripture that we cannot disregard just because we feel. Or we think that that would diminish the Yeshua, which I am a strong believer in Yeshua, our master and our Messiah, the son of the living God. And, you know, it's interesting to see how people respond when they ask me a question about what they want me to say in regards to appease their beliefs. And I, I, I basically respond every time with the way the Bible describes Messiah. I believe Yeshua is Messiah. I believe Yeshua is the Son of God. I believe Yeshua is Ben Adam. Very important term, by the way. Uh, I believe Yeshua will come in the clouds of heaven. I believe Yeshua is a high priest. I believe Yeshua is sits at the right hand of the Father. I believe Yeshua is the Memra of the Word or the Logos. I believe Yeshua is the Son of God. I believe Yeshua is the image of the invisible God. I believe Yeshua is our Redeemer that God gave him the power and authority and also will give him his name uh, upon his return. Every single one of those responses. Oh, he is the representation the express image of his glory. Everything I just said is exactly what the Bible describes Yeshua. Now, what happens is sometimes we are trying to uh, 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 sift through a lot of information and there's a lot of confusion. And what I want to do today is share with you uh, where I'm coming from. You see, one of the things that is not really practiced or in my opinion, studied enough is the roles, the purpose, and the function of Messiah's coming. The role, the function, and the purpose of Messiah's coming. And I've been doing this now, this type of study like this for the last 10 years, and I've learned a lot to the point that my strength and my belief in Messiah has quadrupled because now I'm understanding the purpose, his function, and his role. And neither of those three diminishes his identity. And I need the people here who are with me at the chat to really help me out. Make some uh, make some posts, you know, make comments here so that, you know, we could go ahead and make some comments so we can um, make. I want to make sure you get it here. OK, so let's have the conversation. Did Yeshua resurrect himself or did the father resurrect Yeshua? And if the father resurrected Yeshua, does that diminish Yeshua in any way? Or was Yeshua's willingness to submit to his father as Isaac, who was a 30, 36 to a 37-year-old man, that's a type of Messiah, we know that. When Isaac was taken to the mountain and put on the altar, he willingly gave his life in order for his father, Abraham in this case, to fulfill the will of the creator. 
That's a blueprint. See, many people talk about Abraham taking Isaac to the altar. But no one ever talks about Isaac, a grown man, be willing to be tied up and put on the altar knowing you're going to die. And he was willing to do so in order for his father to find favor with his creator. And that's a blueprint. Let's just say a, 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 an example of what you see. So was, was Yeshua's willingness to submit completely to the father, the plan of God all alone? For what purpose? For what function? So let's go into some of the information. And listen, you don't have to agree with me. And this teaching is not designed to diminish the pre-existence of Messiah or to diminish his work of salvation. He's the way to salvation. But ultimately, God has always been the Savior. God has always been the Redeemer. And he always use it, uses uh, someone to bring forth that plan of restoration forward he did it with joseph to not only bring uh righteousness and justice to egypt he became the viceroy and then he brought salvation to his brothers when they were in famine and gave them prosperity in egypt it happened with moses moses was a type of messiah a prophet like moses shall arise chapter three of the book of hebrews tells you that how yeshua is greater than moses but it's also in chapter 1 and 2 tells you that Yeshua was made lower than the angels for a time. And then it also gives you the purpose of that. And I, I want to submit to you that Yeshua willingly gave his life, allowing himself, although he came from the heavenly realm, he took the form of man, like the Bible says, and then he was willing to fulfill what the Father's will was in order for death to be defeated and for the Lord to be restored, to, for God to be restored into his rightful place. To redeem all of humanity back to the garden. And Yeshua becomes the mediator between God and man. That's what the Bible says. I'm not saying anything the Bible is not saying. So... We need to allow and have the conversation, whether we agree or disagree. Let's have the conversation. Let's stop getting offended every time someone says something that you don't like. And instead ask, wow, uh, I never heard that before. Can you share your resources and let's talk about it? Let's let's do a an exchange of ideas and see where we're at. But unfortunately, we are reactive instead of learning to study. And let's, so I want to just share some of the things, first of all, the hierarchy of the kingdom. No one that I know of is really, well, there are some people, but it's not emphasized. The hierarchy, the structure of a government. So I'm going to quote you a few verses. And, and then what we want to do, we want to be able to understand if there is a hierarchy in the kingdom. And then after I do that, I'm going to quote the two verses that they are trying to use to say that Yeshua resurrected himself. And we're going to study those out. Chapter 2, verse 16 to 22. Chapter 10, verse 14 to 18. And by the way, one of the things that I was basically accused of in the comments was me cherry picking verses to prove my point. Anybody who knows me, they know I don't do that. So we take all the verses that establishes the truth. And we let the truth and the Bible speak for itself. There is a context. Remember, John Walton made a, a very important statement. He said, the Bible is written for us, but it was not written to us. So we must also consider that when Paul was writing and when Luke was writing and when Yeshua was speaking and when John was quoting the word Lord, Kurios in the first century, had also a meaning in the Roman world. And we know that to the Jews it meant something and to the Greeks it meant something. Have we ever considered the cultural background, what the words meant. Because the word gay today doesn't mean the same thing as it meant back 30, 40 years ago. So therefore, there is a disconnect in our understanding of Scripture because we're trying to adapt the Bible that was written for a people at a certain place, at a certain times, with certain events that occurred at that moment, and we're trying to figure it out from our own vernacular. And that would always lead us into error. We have to let the evidence stand for itself. And then we adapt to the evidence. And once you understand the context, and once we see the overall perspective of what is spoken about, 
you will see clearly that no one is diminishing Yeshua. What is showing is perfect order of a kingdom and how the son was willing to do whatever it took in order for his father to be restored and his father's authority to be restored, his father's name to be honored again the way it deserved because Israel and the nations profaned it. Okay, so let's go right into some of the stuff that I have over here. Please be patient with me. I'm going to quote through a lot of verses, and I'm going to give you a lot of information, and I'll stay here as long as I have to. But we need to talk about the conversation. You know, going on social media and make accusations and then having arguments is not going to help anybody. Let's talk about it. You know, let's dialogue. Let us be mature in Messiah and agree and disagree, and it's okay. So everyone in the chat, be a little active and say, yes, I understand, or yes, I do not understand, because you're here with me. So if I'm not presenting it in a way that is edifying you, I know my the audience, by and large, is not going to get it. Okay, so I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing by presenting it correctly. When you study the Bible, we should consider, this is my educational ladder. This is what I use in my, in my studies. This is the blueprint that I use for all my students in like 50 countries, okay? I teach them that when you look at the text, consider whether there is an archaeological perspective that might allow you to see more into the narrative, also the cultural background. And today, we're focusing a lot on the historical, cultural background, geographical, and ultimately temple, okay? And as you continue to climb the ladder of information, by the time you get to the biblical text, you may think it's a lot different than what you thought. Anyone who's been to Israel with me would know that from the moment you go to Israel, by the time you leave Israel and 15 days later, your life has changed because now you have eaten the fruit of the land, you have seen the, the geography and the topography, and you have learned even from the rocks what it means, certain things in the Bible. And now your perspective changes when you read the Bible because now you've been there. Now you've seen it. When somebody tries to tell you something in regards to the land of Israel and they've been to the same place you were and you studied it out, you're gonna he's going to reveal himself quickly whether or not he's been legit or not. You can only fool people when they don't really study certain things and then you tell them what you want them to believe and that's we need to try to avoid that. So, okay, so now watch this. When I study the Bible, I'm looking for what is the purpose of God's kingdom, what is the function of God's kingdom, and what is the role that Israel plays in God's kingdom. So in my opinion, understanding purpose, which is the reason why something is done or created or why something exists. So why is the cosmos so important to God? In the book of Genesis, right away we see it. We see how God gives function to creation. He establishes man and he breathed his spirit upon Adam. He was a dead with no name, with no identity, no function, no purpose, no role. The moment that God breathed the breath of life in Adam, now he gives them a purpose to be the gardener in his garden. He gives them a function to do the work and to keep. And the role is to maintain the sacred space, to maintain the garden pure of any uh, uh, impurities. Now, Adam... He fails in his role. He allows sin to come and he's exiled. Immediately after exiled, there is death. His son murder and, uh, his own brother. And immediately after all of that, you have God's desire to restore humanity. Now, this perspective, when I was talking to my teacher, Joseph Good, this morning, he brought that up. And I'm thinking, man, that's a good point. I want to mention it in the teaching. I want to give him credit to him. So we see the plan of God trying to be developed from the beginning. He used Noah as the Messiah figure with a purpose, with a function, with a role. He gave Abraham a purpose, a function, and a role. He gave uh, uh, Joseph the same thing, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now Moses. He gave Israel a purpose, function, and a role. And they did not follow through on it. So what is a function? An activity or purpose natural or intended for a person or thing. Okay. Now, what is the role of Israel? It was uh, the, A role is a function assumed 
part performed by a person or a thing in a particular situation. So the role of Messiah ultimately was to do the will of the Father for the purpose of restoring the cosmos. Because God so loved the cosmos, the world, that he sent his begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what the premise is, that he's sending his Son in order for us to return back to him so that he may dwell among us. Yeshua becomes the microcosm and the shape and the form and the image of this invisible God. And the message of Yeshua was to restore the righteousness and justice of God. That was his function. That's why he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He did all that in the authority of the Father. So therefore, there is a hierarchy. The kingdom and the hierarchy. God is always the sovereign. We say that in the prayers. Baruch Atta Adonai Eloenu, Melech Haolam. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. And then we see Yeshua, who is portrayed in the Bible as a prince. How do we know? Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 5. I don't want to feel rushed, guys. I mean, this is an important topic. Now there have been a lot of um, people saying stuff and having their comments is only fair that we present it and then let the, let people wait out the information and let them just, you know, weigh it out and see what happens. But I'm not going to stop believing something the Bible tells me because it makes some people uncomfortable. We have to be honest and we have to be faithful as long as the, the, the commitment to our Messiah is not compromised. Many people leave Messiah because they ask them difficult questions and people don't have the answers. I said, no, 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 he's this and you have to accept it and that's it. No, people want to know. Is God always been the Savior? Yes, the prophets tells you. Okay? But did, did he give the role of Messiah to reveal the salvation of God? Absolutely, the Bible tells us that. So understanding the function, the role, and the purpose will help us understand. So in Acts, chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, but I want to focus in 30 and 31. It says, the God of our fathers raised up Yeshua, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Now, verse 31 is important. Him, Yeshua, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Now, you may say, well, why didn't say king and savior? Because you have to understand ancient Near Eastern hierarchy. It's called suzerain vassal treaties. In the ancient world, just like in the Roman Empire, Pilate was a vassal of the emperor. Just like Herod was a prince of all the kings of the earth for the emperor. In other words, he, the king was the emperor. He was the sovereign over all the kings in his kingdom. Okay, so therefore, God is always the king, and the king of Israel is his prince. Let me repeat that again. God is always the king over everything. And the earth, uh, I'm sorry, and Israel, God has given the kingship to the line of David. But David and Solomon were called prince of God. They are God's prince on the earth. They are his representative. That's why it's the right hand of God in the majesty. That is an, a language of enthronement, a language of honor. And, and, and by the way, in the temple, let me show you what it means. In the first temple period, this is, let me go here real quick. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see it. This is a temple. So you are wet. You're on the Mount of Olives. I'm looking east right now. And you're looking towards the west. This is the Harabite, the Temple Mount. This is where the temple is. The temple is what, where God has placed his feet, his throne on the earth forever. Okay. Now, to the right of the temple, or the south of it, you find the palace of David. You find the palace of um, Solomon when he built the temple. Right here. That meant to the right of his power. That's where the king of Israel, who is the prince of the great king. Anyone who understands engineers knows this. So for me to, to read that Yeshua is prince and savior is not a problem to me. What it's showing me is that there is a hierarchy of power and authority. And we will prove that point in a minute. Just allow me to just state my case here. Okay. Is this making sense so far? Let me know. All right. So. It says, God is always the sovereign. Yeshua is the prince. 
but he's the king of Israel. He's the mediator. He's the son of God. And he is also called Ben Adam, the son of Adam, which leads to the question in regards to Daniel. Daniel talks about the son of Adam. Okay. So therefore, the son of Adam is connected with Mashiach. And if you go through the gospel uh, narrative, anytime Yeshua says, I'm the son of man, they wanted to kill him. I wonder why, because that is actually a, a, uh, a, um, uh, a uh, it's attributing his divine nature. Okay. His preexistence. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then you have Israel who are the vassals. We are all grafted into the tree. We are all grafted into the 12 tribes. So therefore we are the vassals of the great king. Now Yeshua becomes the mediator, the king, and also a priest. The priests and kings were mediators between God and man. Now Yeshua is doing the role of the high priest. So he's a mediator and he has to be submitted to the greater than him. In other words, here while you have Yeshua as a high priest sitting at the right hand of the father, waiting until God make his enemies his full stool. It's a language of enthronement. It's a language that he's waiting until. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians, it gives us a language of a hierarchy. Now, I need to show you how this works in order to believe that Yeshua was resurrected by the Father because there is purpose, there is function, and there are roles to be played in order for death to be defeated. And Yeshua voluntarily says, hey, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Israel didn't do it. I'm willing to do it. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11.3. 11, However, I want you to know that the head of every man is Messiah. And the head of, of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Now, why would Paul use this language if it was not true? And he's using it through different letters, by the way. Okay, he's used this language. So he's given us a hierarchy of order of a kingdom. In this case, in, this, in, the, in the city of Corinth, in regards to the mess that was going on in the city of Corinth and uh, the worship of Asclepius, Apollos, and you know Aphrodite and all that crazy stuff going on in imperial worship and imperial cult that we hardly ever study. So when we study the letters, consider the cultural background to know the setting in which Paul is saying stuff. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we need to deal, we need to have the conversation. And I need you guys here to be active in the chat because these are verses that is telling me something that we need to address. Now, understand that Yeshua is still Messiah. That's not compromised, <laughs> that he's still before the foundation of the world. We understand that, okay? But we need to understand what the role and the purpose and the and the uh, and the function was of his coming. What was he trying to accomplish? Let's talk about that. Let's stop focusing so much on his identity because ultimately, at the end, no one really understands it. We can only go by what we read. We can only assume what we're understanding here, a document that was written two thousand years ago. But what is the function? What is the reason that he came? What is the purpose of restoration of the kingdom? And why is death so important to be defeated in order for you and I to be part of the kingdom and have everlasting life? Why is resurrection the main point of Paul's letters? It's not the cross, it's not death, it's resurrection. Because he even tells us in chapter 15, if he did not resurrect, then we're wasting time. So why did God need to resurrect him? And why did Yeshua allow himself to become lower than the angels just for a time in order for the Father to fulfill that, which is a prophecy of Isaiah 25.8. Let's go to Isaiah 25.8. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8 says this. 25, 1 to 28. Give me one second. 25, 8 says, And he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away every tears from their faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for all the for the Lord has spoken. Now, you got to keep that in mind. That is quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 4. This is the core of the coming of Messiah. So 2 Timothy says this, chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. For this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior which wants all men to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and also one mediator between God and man, 
the men Yeshua, the Messiah, who gave himself as a ransom for all, testimony given in due time about him. Now, understand that here we have God's purpose and Yeshua's role and function. If you read this, understanding purpose, role, and function, we see it in these verses. Let's read it again. For this, for, for this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior which wants all men to be saved. That's the purpose of sending Messiah. For all of humanity to be saved and have the full knowledge of the truth. And then it says, for there is one God. Paul is saying there's one God. And also one mediator between God and man. And he tells you who that is. Yeshua the Messiah. And then it tells you his role. To give himself a ransom for all. That's the point. Okay, so that doesn't diminish Yeshua in any way. If anything, what it does, it exalts him because now he is willing to leave his holy abode and disregard himself, being lower than the angels, take the form of man uh, as you and I, right? Obviously, he's not created. And obviously, he is, I believe, he comes from a supernatural birth. Please understand that. We're talking about roles, okay? We're going to go what the Bible says. So that his father can resurrect him and... Whoever defeats death is considered victorious over creation. If you go back to ancient Near Eastern principles, you'll see that all through the Torah and the prophets. So let's read. Let's read. Are you learning something so far? Is this making sense to you? Let's read 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to go right there first. And we're going to try to the best way to do it is by going to verses, okay? So I'm going to give you some uh, introduction. We're going to go to John 2, John 10, and then we go on after I show you a hierarchy. But I need to show you the hierarchy in the heavenly realm. I'm sorry, in the earthly realm. The way God established it through scripture, and the in this case, Paul talks about it. So the chapter 15 of the book of Corinthians is specifically focused on resurrection. And we know this. But by the way, many people have not really read 1 Corinthians completely. We need to read the whole thing. But right now, we don't have the time. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So when we read verse 20, listen to this. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead. Now, please understand, it doesn't say he raised himself from the dead. Never you're going to find that. I have not seen that in the Bible. I may be wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But I have not seen any verse that says that he resurrected himself, that he was raised. Okay. Okay. It says, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since through a man came death, and I was going to lead you back to Genesis, also through a man came the resurrection of the dead. For just as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive but each in his own group. Messiah, the first fruits, then those who are Messiahs at his coming. Now, I want you to pay attention. Now, guys, please, this is the scripture. I'm not making this stuff up. We need to be honest with what we're reading and ask the question, why is Paul using this language and why is the Bible always using this language? Peter calls them prince. John in Revelation 1.5 calls them leader or ruler or prince. Here he calls them the one who will give the kingdom back to the father. Listen to this. Then the end. When he, he here is Yeshua. When he hangs over the kingdom to the God and the and father. And when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For it is necessary for him to reign until him in this case is, is Yeshua. He's going to reign in the millennial age. That's what we believe. Until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For he subjected all things under his feet. Okay. But when it says all things are subjected. It is clear that the one who subjected all things to him is not included. Listen to what it says. He said he subjected all things under his feet. Who subjected all things under his feet? The father, right? Give him all the authority, all the power to rule and reign. Says, but when he says all things are subjected, it is clear that the one who subjected all things to him is not included. 
but whenever all things are subjected to him, listen to the last part, then the son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him in order that God may be all in all. That's a hierarchy. So that means that Yeshua has a purpose, a function, and a role. Sent by the Father, the Son of God, the express image of his glory, but he has a function, purpose, and a role. We have to respect that because the Bible tells us that. Okay? All right. So with that being said, let's go back to the, let's go back real, real quick right here. And, oh, okay, this is what I want to do. Uh, go here to the power. Okay. All right. So let me read you now from a Midrash. A Midrash is quite interesting. I was doing research on the book of Hebrews and I was doing the research. There's a resource and I started reading the resource about the very point that I'm talking about. And the writer, who's a Christian scholar, by the way, he said that Yeshua needed to experience uh, death in all, in, in other words, so he was made lower than the angels. Okay, to and so, but then he quotes something from what is called Pasikta Rabati 36, uh, 161a. This is what we see right in here. And this really call call uh, this really, really, really caught my attention. Now, so what I did, I went to one of my dear friends in Israel who's a Hebrew scholar. And I told him, okay, I need you to read this. And we went to the source, it's in Sepharia, Sepharia, but it's all in Hebrew. And it has no Nikud, so I had a tough time reading it. And I didn't want to make any mistakes, so my Hebrew is not that great. It's getting better, but not that great. So he read it, and he read the whole thing, and he said, he. and I need to make the disclaimer because I don't want to uh, uh, send the wrong message. Then yesterday, in my Spanish class, uh, one of my Hebrew teachers, uh, she actually read the whole thing, and she validated what my friend in Israel said. So we have the two witnesses that said the same thing. But I'm going to read it to you here, and then I'm going to explain to you the little difference that you see in the Hebrew. So you don't think I'm, de I'm deceiving you in any way by giving you the wrong translation. This is taken directly from the source, from the scholarly source. But in the Pasikta Rabati 36, 161a, which is a, uh, um, uh, it's a midrash, it's a midrash on actually Isaiah 25, 8. And it says this, when Satan saw the soul of the pre-existent Messiah, he said, Truly, this is the Messiah who will plunge me and the angel princes of the nations, talking about the, the leaders of the nations, unto Gehinon. Okay? As it is written, he will devour death forever. Now, the, the, the key word here is pre existent Messiah. In the Hebrew, it doesn't use the word pre existent Messiah, but what it does say is that in the in the Hebrew, for what I was told, is that God had the Messiah and he hid him under his throne, okay, before the foundations of the world. So it actually is inferring a pre existent Messiah, that he was already in existence before the foundations of the world. That's why the Christian commentator, in his words, he put pre existent. Because the the uh, the um, the context of the whole paragraph. Are you with me? Please make sure that you're with me here. I need to know that you get this. This is for you guys. Because when somebody says something, well, Rico said you heard the teaching. Hopefully, you'll be a witness to what for what we're saying in context. Does that make sense? How many of you have never seen that quote before? How many of you never seen that quote before? That's okay. Perfect. So you see, now you're understanding that even in Middle Ages, Judaism, there was a teaching in regards to the pre-existent Messiah or the Messiah who lived before the foundation of the world. Interesting. The Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. That's another stuff. Oh, another topic. Okay. Now, normally I don't quote the Book of Enoch, and I did not quote this yesterday. It's a pseudopocrypha. In other words, these books, there are some arguments in the scholarly world when they were written. But I believe it was in the uh, in the intertestamental period. Normally, I don't use it. I read them. I've studied them before. But now people are trying to use them as scripture. I'm only using them as a as a commentary to give me an idea what the mindset was during that time frame. Some people accept them. Some people don't. But anyway, I'm just going to read uh, chapter 46 of the first Enoch. Okay, it says, "At that place, I saw the one to whom belongs the time before time, and his head." 
was white like wool, like the Ancient of Days. And there was with him another individual whose face was like that of a human being, Ben Adam. His countenance was full of grace like the one among the holy angels. And I asked the one from among the angels who was going with me and who was who. And who had revealed to me all the secrets regarding the one who was born of human beings? Who is this? And from hence is he, and who is going as the prototype of the before time? And he answered to me and he says, this is Ben Adam. Very interesting. Now, it's interesting that Joe and I were talking about it this morning. He says that some scholars question whether or not uh, first Enoch was written after the time of Yeshua, but they found some remnants in the Qumran community uh, before Yeshua. It was actually, I think, about 100 to 150 years before Yeshua, they, they, the Qumran community was already talking about First Enoch. So it's quite interesting. It's giving you an idea, more or less, what they were thinking during the intertestamental period about the, um, the um, uh, prophecies and, you know, uh, apocalyptic literature. Okay? So listen to what it says. It says, and I asked the one from among the angels. I think I already read that. Number three. And he answered to me and said to, uh, and he said to me, this is Ben Adam, the son of men, to whom belongs righteousness and with whom righteousness dwells. And he will open all the hidden storerooms for the Lord of the spirits has chosen him. The Lord of the spirits here is the ancient of days. Exactly what the book of uh, Daniel tells us, the ancient of days. And there was one like the son of man riding in the clouds of heaven. And he is destined to be victor victorious before the Lord of the spirits in eternal uprightness. The son of man whom you have seen is the one who will remove the kings and the mighty ones from their comfortable seats and the strong ones from their thrones. He shall choose the reins of the strong and crush the teeth of the sinners. He shall depose the kings from their thrones and their kings. For they do not exalt and glorify him, and neither do they obey him, the source of their kingship. Okay, so it's talking about victory. Okay, and it says, the faces of the strong will be slapped and be filled with shame and gloom. Their dwelling places and their beds will be warmed. They shall have no hope to rise before their bed, and they do not extol the name of the Lord of the Spirit. You see? So it gives you an idea what they were thinking at the time. Now, with that being said, now, what we've been talking about so far is that we have a hierarchy in the heavenly realm. Uh, we show you the verses. And they are, there's a function, there's a purpose, and there's a role. And I'm going to repeat those three words so much. Hopefully, it'll be ingrained in your mind when you study the Bible. You always look for function, role, and purpose. Now, let's go to the verses that the interpretation has to do with John chapter 2. Verse 16 to 22. We need to look at all the evidence. If I'm wrong, I'm willing to change it. It's not a problem. But we have to wait out the evidence. If one thing is true, then it has to be consistent throughout the whole thing. And what I see in all the evidence, and we will read all the verses later, is that there's a disconnect, maybe in understanding one and the other. And we need to have the conversation to try to come to some kind of solution so we don't fall over ourselves arguing about stuff when all we need to do is sit down and research that makes sense okay so let's read in um john let's go to the book of john chapter two okay the book of john chapter two verse 16 to 22 you have the wedding at canaan then you have the first journey to jerusalem and then yeshua cleansing the temple okay these are very important verses because that's their argument. And it is a fair argument. I mean, it's there. So you want to understand it. I don't have a problem with that. It's part of the whole process. It says, and he found in the temple courts those who dwell, who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated. And he made a whip of cords and drove them out of the temple, both sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins on the money changers and overturned their tables. And the one selling the doves said, said take these things away from here. And to the one selling the, uh, the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that, is, that it is written, seal for your house will consume me. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us, show to us, because you are doing these things? Yeshua answered and said to them, destroy this temple, 
and in three days I will raise it up. Perfect. Got it. Interesting that when Yeshua dies, the temple later is destroyed. And when Yeshua returns, then the third temple will be restored. Interesting. Because the temple and Messiah is interconnected. But that's another conversation. Okay. It says, then the Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, please understand that verse 21 is the commentary, is the writer saying, no, 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 he's talking about his body. And then verse 22 says, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had this to say, and they believed the scripture and saying that Yeshua has spoken. Perfect. Now, when you go to John chapter 10, okay, John chapter 10, they are making two connections. This one in the temple, I will raise it up, which we know as a language of new creation. The scholars agree with that. Okay. And remember the tabernacle, God says, build me a mishkan that I may dwell within you. A mishkan, there's two, there's two things. There's a mishkan and the, and the mikdash. So he said, I, I said mishkan, I'm sorry, it's wrong. Build me a, big, a mikdash that I may dwell within you. There is a mishkan and the mikdash. The temple is called the Beit Hamikdash, the house of the presence, meaning that the intent of the tabernacle was to host the presence of God where there's life. Okay? So the temple was the physical. Yeah? So therefore, our temple, our body is supposed to be a temple. Us supposed to be a temple. That we're supposed to be holy unto the Lord, separated. We cannot be holy unto the Lord until death is defeated. In the meantime, we make confession that Yeshua resurrected, that God resurrected Yeshua, and then we are, we shall be saved. We are sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise. So on that topic altogether. Now let's go read in chapter 10, verse 14 to 18. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. And I laid my down, my life down for the sheep. Now, remember, is using the metaphor of the sheep and the shepherd in order to show, you know, how he takes care of the flock. Now, please remember that in the Bible, in the Torah and the prophets, God has always been the chief shepherd. He's been the gardener, but he put Adam to help him. He was the shepherd of the flock, but he put Moses to guide it. Understand that he also put the king of Israel to lead his flock. All right, just remember that. So Yeshua says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own known me just as the father knows me. And I know the father. And I lay my, da my life down for, sh for the sheep. And I have other sheep which are not called of this fold. I must bring these also and they shall hear my voice. And they will become my one flock, one shepherd. Got it. Because of this, the Father loves me because he's willing to lay his life down, remember. And because I lay my down my life that I may take possession of it again. In other words, he lays it down again and he would take possession of it again, right? He's not saying that he's going to resurrect himself, but watch. He says, no one takes it from me. I lay it down voluntarily. He did it voluntarily in order for God to fulfill the prophecy in Isaiah 25, 8. There should not be a problem with this. It's only uplifting the honor of God. It says, I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take possession of it again. This commandment I received from my father. Okay. But he laid it down voluntarily. He did it voluntarily. Okay. So, therefore... Even among the Jews, there was division because of these words, okay? So, as we continue reading, now we're going to go to the verses in which it caught my attention to understand this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, okay? When we go to Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm doing a study chapter for chapter in the book of Hebrews. Last week, I covered it, but I didn't really focus on this too much. I was focusing on something else. But then when this whole thing occurred, 
I, they quoted these verses and I understood that he did it voluntarily for what purpose, for what function, for what role. Then Hebrews chapter one kind of gives me the explanation. It tells you the reason why Yeshua was made lower than the angels. There's a purpose why Yeshua gave it voluntarily. What is the purpose? That's what we need to find out. We're not talking about his identity. We're talking about his purpose, his role. He's trying to uplift the honor of God. How come I believe Yeshua's Messiah? And how come do I believe that, he's, that he comes from eternity, uh, or whatever people want to call it, or from the beginning or, or before creation? I don't even know. Okay? I don't know what people will be happy with, what definition. But let me read you this. John 17, verse 1 through 5. It says, Yeshua spoke these words, lift up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son and your son may glorify you. So clearly we know that Yeshua said he's the son. The words are there and he said it. He's the son. He's speaking to the father. All right. As you have commanded him authority over all flesh. I'm sorry. You have given him authority over all flesh that he should have, give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That means that although he has some kind of level of authority, is he's submitting completely under the Father's authority, clearly. And we're going to see verses in that regard. It says, verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and then says, and Yeshua the Messiah, whom you have sent. I, I will be surprised if people will have an argument with me about Yeshua being the Shaliach, the sent one. Did you all agree here that Yeshua is the sent one? So was Yeshua acting on his own accord? Oh, he, he was always behaving according to the will of the Father. Okay, so now, in verse 4, I have glorified you on earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourselves. Now, I listen to the language. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, I'm going to take you here to these verses. Let me, let me, instead of going to Hebrews here real quick, I'm going to take you to, I'm going to take you to John, um, to John 17 and another Bible here, and we're going to look at this verse, okay? John 17. John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, you have glorified me at your side. When you look into here, it says, literally, by the side of yourself. That's what it says in the Greek. Okay? With the glory that I had at your side. Literally, by the side of yourself. Before the world existed. So clearly, I believe Yeshua is not of this realm. The problem is, how does that work? I don't know. But I know what the Bible tells me and defines who he is. So let's, let's, why don't we focus on what the Bible tells us? Okay. Okay. So now Hebrews chapter one, verse one, all the way to chapter two, verse 16. We're going to study this. Then I'm going to give you all the verses that talks about resurrection. Is that okay? And then we're going to allow the evidence to stand by itself. Did God resurrect Yeshua? If yes, then what was the purpose? What was the function? And what was the role of Messiah? And what is the whole ultimate master plan be, by, behind all this? And after we have to ask, then was the perfect plan taking into effect the right way? Or are we trying to change something that the Bible clearly tells us with the evidence? That's what we need to investigate, dialogue, and examine. That's it. We have to sit down and talk. It's no big deal. If I'm wrong, I'm willing to change. But please don't come with the argument based on one verse or two, applying it and forcing me to believe your definitions. I don't think that's fair. You know, let's look at the Bible. Although God spoke long enough in many parts and in many ways to the fathers by the prophets in these last days to us by a son. Now, remember God speaking to us by the son whom he appointed heir of all things who appointed heir. God appointed his son, heir of all things. It was through his approval. It says, through whom? 
through whom he also made the world. We don't we don't disagree with that. Okay, it's through the word of the Lord. The, who is, listen to this, who is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. I want to ask you guys here who are here in the chat and every one of you that are watching me who are not here present in the live programming. Um, have you ever looked at the word, the representation of his essence in the Greek and what it means? Yes or no, please? Have you looked at that word representation and what it means? All of you answer and let me know so I can get an idea. How many of the people that are here have done that? Get an idea. Perfect. So you never really look into it. That's okay. But I want to share with you what it says, which is based, is the basis for what I'm believing. Okay. Let me read the whole thing first. Who is the radiance of his glory and the representations of his essence, sustaining all things by the word of power. When he had made purification, purification for sins through him, God made purifications for sins through Yeshua. Purifying us from where? From what? Chapter 2 is going to tell you. But you got to read the whole thing. It says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Yeshua sat down at the right hand. Remember the temple? God sits on his throne. The prince of God, the king of Israel, sits at his right hand. It's a language of honor and power and enthronement. Okay, having become so much better than the angels by as much as he has inherited a more excellent name than theirs. Now, I want you to notice the beautiful contrast that the writer of the Hebrews, I don't believe it was Paul. Uh, actually, let's go back to the word representation. So what does the word representation mean? We're going to study, and it's going to give you the Greek word. The Greek word is character. Okay, character, representation, mark engraved, character or nature. You can go to any of these commentaries. Okay, I'm not going to read these because I already have uh, this one that I think I read them all. It means all the same. Mark engraved, character, nature, representation, representation, impress, stamp, reproduction, representation outward appearance form let's look at the uh this particular commentary which is the uh new international dictionary of new testament theology by uh, colin brown okay it, it defines the strongs 5917 which is character which means impress stamp reproduction representation outward appearance keep that in mind so what does this definition uh definitions means I'm going to read you in the secular world, and then I'm going to read you in the New Testament. It says, character is a noun derived from carasso, notch, indent, meaning one who sharpens, scratches, or later one who writes in stone, wood, or metal. Hence, it came to mean an embolser or a stamp for making, for making stamped coins. And from this, looking to the result, the embossed stamp made of the co on the coin. Character is written, uh, uh, character in written style. Finally, it came to mean the basic bodily and psychological structure with which one is born. That's what happened later. Now, um, that, by the way, this is the reason why God says, be holy for I am holy. It tells you right here, this concept cannot really be found in the Old Testament. The thing about character Though it may remind us slightly of the passages about imigodia. In other words, imitating your God. That's why God says, be holy for I am holy. Okay? The word found in the Septuagint is actually Leviticus 13, 29, 28. And it's in reference to, uh, to a scar. Okay? But in the New Testament, however, this word is only found once. In the whole New Testament. Let me show you what I mean. When I go right here for character. If you go down to this pie chart and I click on it, it's only one verse in the whole New Testament in which the word character representation, okay, or or or, or the other definitions is found. Hebrews 1.3. That's very important to know. Okay. So when you read into the definition of character from this particular commentary, it says character is only found once in the uh, in the New Testament. Christ is the character 
and I can't pronounce those other words, says the very stamp of God's nature. Okay? The very stamp. He's the representation of what God and his character is on the earth. That's what the Bible says. It says, the one on whom God has stamped or imprinted his being. This means that the New Testament uses it's entirely different from our modern concept of character, which develop itself by a will that seeks to conform to principle. Similarly, in Hebrews 5.8 declares that Yeshua learned obedience through what he suffered. There is no thought of our concept of character formation here. So it is probably linked that the son's obedience to the father is tested in temptation. Okay? The son possesses the stamp of God's nature just as he is. Apausugama, radiance, effulgence, reflection. The moon is the reflection of the, of the uh, we get the light from the sun, but at night we get the reflection from the moon. Okay? Because the moon doesn't produce any light in itself. Okay? So therefore... The effulgence of God's splendor. He who sees and recognizes him sees and knows the Father, like in John 14, 7. If you know me, you have known my Father also. Why? Because God, through his effort, put his imprint. But Yeshua is living according to the character of God, following the Torah, doing righteousness and justice. And by doing the miracles he did, he is showing that he is working on behalf of the Father on the earth, just like Moses did and just like Israel was supposed to do. From now on, you know, oh, I'm sorry, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, it means curious or master. Show us your show us the Father, and it's and it's enough for us. Yeshua said to him, "Am I with you so long, so uh, so long a time, and you have not seen me? Have not known me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. You can say, show us the Father. Do you believe that I am in the Father? Let me go, let me go there real quick. That I I am. Let me read it right here." That I am in the Father. See, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The word that I say to you, I do not speak from myself, but the Father residing in me does his work. Okay? Believe me that I, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the works themselves. It's talking about the image. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I'm doing, he will do, he will do greater works than these because I am going, I am going to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, I will do this in order that the Father may glorify in the Son. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Okay. Does that make sense? So now the word there for, you know, character is actually imprint. Image of God. The context of Hebrews 1 makes it clear that the writer's purpose was to stress that the glory of the Son who had, ent who had entered history and the uniqueness of the revelation of God is the unique one. In verse 3, we have probably, and there, uh, that's another conversation here, talks about this. But the Son controls the beginning and the end, according to Hebrews 1, 2. Stands in unique relationship to God of effulgence. I can't pronounce that word. Right. And stamp, character, he is. To the universe, which he upholds, and to the congregation, which he, he has purified from sin. And then you can read all of this going through here. Okay. So how many of you did not know that the word representation represented a reproduction, a representation, outward appearance, imprints, stamp? By the way, do you know that Colossians tells you the same thing? When you go to Colossians, let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 3. We give thanks always to God the Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, when we pray for, for you. 
since we heard about your faith in Messiah Yeshua and the love that you have for all the saints because of a hope reserved for you in heaven, which you have heard about beforehand in the word of truth, the gospel. Okay? Say, and has come to you just as all and all the world is bearing fruit and increasing, just also among from on the day you heard about the and understood the grace of God in truth. And just as you learned it from Ephrath, uh, Epaphras, our dear brother and slave who is who is faithful minister of Messiah on our behalf. Because this also we, from the day that we heard it, did not cease praying for you, asking that you may be filled the, with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual insight, that you may live in a manner worthy of the, worthy of the Lord to please in all aspects, bearing fruit in every good deed, increasing in the knowledge of God. And then he keeps going here, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you for a share of the inheritance in this of the saints in light, who has rescued us. Listen to this. This is the this is the purpose of Yeshua's death and resurrection and God resurrecting him. Giving thanks to the Father. I'm sorry. Yeah. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you for a share of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has rescued us. And the, the word there should be afimi, I hope. You see, it's a different one. No, it's a different one. Rescued us from the domain of darkness, which means death, and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. And forgiveness of sin. Now check this out. The word forgiveness here should be the word aphesis. Aphesis, a pardon. If you stick with me in the book of Hebrews, we will talk about that a little bit more. That means a, uh, a forgiveness. It's a medical term. As a matter of fact, I have an article right here that I saw last night. And the article reads like this. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it here in a minute. Let me try to share it with you. Uh, right here. It's an article that I saw. I've done the research on this. For, uh, forgiveness, aphesis. It's a Greek study. It means forgiveness, release. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later. It gives you every instance connected with Jubilee. But the real cool thing is that this word, aphesis, is used in medical language of the relaxation or remission of a disease. Interesting. It's in the context of what is uh, med uh, medicine. That's important for us to know. Because we have been cured of a sickness there was no solution for, which is called death. That's the reason why Yeshua came to took be, became for a time a little lower than the angels so that God, so he can experience death just like we do. Okay. Because God wants to restore humanity back to the garden. And Adam sinned, so the last Adam brings life. Okay, now it says, In whom we have redemption, a forgiveness of sins, who is the image, the word image. What is the word image? A con, image, image in the mind, likeness. Likeness. Okay? It's an idol inscribed. Sell him. Exactly what it was. Adam was like an image. But sell him in the image and likeness. It says of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. Okay. Because all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. Things visible and invisible. With the thrones and dominions. Rules and powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he himself is before all. We, we got that. We, we believe that. The issue is that it's telling us that Yeshua is a representation of God. And he now came over to do a purpose. What purpose is that? To reveal to humanity how God is going to bring remission. He's going to bring a, a pardon of something that the sacrificial system, the temple service, the temple service could not, could not justify anyone. It didn't matter how many uh, about death. The temple service Neither sacrifice, Yom Kippur, no one. No offering can do away with the problem of death. The temple helped you and the offerings and the, and the temple to purify the temple because your sins will profane the temple. Your sins will defile the temple. 
Leviticus 16, 16. That's why Yom Kippur's atonement to cleanse the altar because the sins of Israel defile the temple. But you can live a perfect Torah life, perfect, okay? And you can keep every commandment perfectly and you still will die. So the whole premise of Yeshua's coming is not to do away with the Torah or the temple or the sacrificial system. The whole coming of Messiah was so that through Yeshua, a righteous and a moral man will die and then God will vindicate him, will raise him from the dead in order for God to be proclaimed victorious over creation and now Yeshua becomes the last Adam that will take us back to the garden. And that lines up with what the Bible says. Can the Bible verify what I just said? Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13. Are you enjoying this, guys? Are you enjoying it okay? I hope you like it. Okay. All right. What does Acts chapter, and I'll come back to this later, but in Acts chapter 13, I hope somebody's keeping track how many verses I'm giving you. And I don't give verses just because I want to be impressed, impressing you by verses. We're trying to give you evidence. Okay, watch. We're going to go back to Hebrews in a minute. But listen to what Acts 13 tells us in regards to the coming of Messiah. Okay. In verse 29 forward, it says, And when they have carried out all the things that were written about him, they took him down from the tree and placed him in the tomb. And But God raised him from the dead. Now remember that the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, that has a purpose, a function, and a role. Yeshua has a role to play in it. There's a purpose that God is allowing it. Okay? And there's a function of why he needs to resurrect. So reason. Okay, and it says, who appeared for many days to those who have come from the uh, to him with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we proclaim the good news. What is the good news? Hey guys, God brought release. That's what Yeshua told us in the synagogue in the first time he went there. Not the first time, but he read from the, the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Okay. To preach the good tidings, the good news. To proclaim liberty to the Gospels. Do you know the word aphasis that I read you earlier? Is exactly the same word found there in Luke chapter 4, 18. The word connected with release. The word connected with remission. The word connected with remission and also jubilee on the Shemitah year. Okay. So therefore, I proclaim the good news to you. That the promise that was made to the fathers. This promise God has fulfilled in our children. By raising Yeshua. God has fulfilled to our children by raising Yeshua. Or raising Yeshua. It says right here that it's supplied by. But that's okay. It's raising. It's easily understood. Okay. God has fulfilled to our children raising Yeshua. As it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have fathered you. That's an adoption language, guys. If you go back to ancient Near Eastern language, and God did it with David, and he did it with Solomon. I will be your father, you will be my son. Okay? Verse 34. But that he has raised him from the dead. Now remember, God has raised him from the dead. Now he's going to tell you the purpose. He says, no more going to return to decay. He has spoken on this way. I will give you the reliable divine decrees of David. Therefore, he also said to in another psalm, you will not permit your Holy One to experience decay. For David, after serving the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. In other words, he died. And was buried with his fathers and experienced decay. But he, Yeshua, whom God Raised from the dead, raised did not experience decay. Okay, so who raised Yeshua here? Who does the text tell you? Can you guys, in the plain text, not speculating, we're not adding to it, it's consistent, and we're going to be reading a lot, more, a lot more verses. Okay, so help me out, guys. Who raised Yeshua here? Okay, so now watch this. Therefore, this is the key verse, 38 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brethren and brothers, that through this one, through this one, who's this one here? Yeshua. Through him, 
through this one, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. You know that word forgiveness right there? You want to see which word it is again? Is the word aphesis. Is the word aphesis again, a pardon. Now we know the purpose. The function is to allow himself to die at the hands of the enemy so that God can restore him so that now legally we have the decree completely nailed to the cross that was against us. It's not the Torah that's against us. It's the curse of the law, which is death, that's against humanity. And God has given us a decree and he has remission. He has destroyed that decree through the resurrection of Yeshua. It says that through this one, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And from all the things, watch, and from all the things which you were not able to be justified by the law of Moses. You can bring all the offerings. You can keep every, every commandment perfectly. You can bring all the tithe. You can obey. You can be righteous. You can be holy. You can do all that stuff. You still will die. Right? The Torah, although perfect, to keep you in God's sacred space on the earth. Okay? You still, that's what keeps you in the covenantal relationship. That keeps you in the in, in the will of the Father. Therefore, when you die with a confession that He's your God and there's no one else, then He will respond to you and He and you believe that God resurrected Yeshua, then you shall be saved. Because by proclaiming that, you are saying that no other God, the God of Israel, is the only one who has dominion over creation because he has defeated chaos he had defeated death he had defeated uh, uh uh the sea he had defeated uh this order and he has brought light from darkness okay did that make sense to you are you with me so far i'm going to keep asking that because i know people have their questions and you it's fair to have them it's okay we are looking into it let's go back to the book of hebrews Let's go back to Hebrews. So when we read in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, it's easy sometimes to make an assumption, to make an accusation, or to have a theological position as, if you don't believe it like me, then you're not this. And I think it's wiser if we take the time to dialogue and exchange information. Okay? By the way, how many new things have you learned already that I'm sharing with you that you probably probably never considered before? The word offices or, you know, the, some of the stuff we're talking about. So let's continue here. Now watch verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter uh, 1 of the book of Hebrews is telling you how Yeshua is superior than the angels. In other words, he is not like those angels. For example, in Daniel 12, let me read you this. This is a huge controversy among certain circles. Because the Bible says here, and I want you to consider these verses, because they believe uh, in, the, in the time of Yeshua that the, the, the law came through angels and stuff like that. Actually, the Bible even talks about it in a few verses. But let me read this for you. It says, at the time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince shall stand watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be for a time trouble such as never seen and there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered, and everyone will be found written in the book, okay, in the book of life, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame of everlasting contempt. So it's talking about resurrection. Now, it's a huge argument about who is this Michael? Okay, well, I don't believe Yeshua is Michael, but what does the word represent? What's the definition? Of the word Michael. Now, this is my, I'm giving you my opinion now, okay? You don't have to agree with me on this. I'm giving you my opinion. It's talking about resurrection. But what does the word Michael mean? Check this out. The word Michael, when you look it up in the commentaries, it means, uh, Michael, for what I understood was like um, image, or let me, um, let me go back. Michael, halo, see what it says here. Michael, guardian of Israel, a guardian of Israel, or someone who is like him, or uh, I was I looked into one of the definitions. It was that um, image of God. Okay, Michael, 
Okay, and let me keep looking and see where I find it. There are all the places where Michael might make. Does anybody not have the definition there real quick? Let me look for it here. Michael. What's the definition of Michael? Let me find out. So when I looked it up, and I'm going like, I didn't know that. So when I look at the definition of Michael, give me a second. Okay. Who is like God or a gift? Who is like God or a gift from God? I believe, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, guys, that the prophecy here is talking about exactly what Hebrew says. He's the image of the representation of the gift of God who will stand there as a prince. Okay, but I don't believe Yeshua is Michael. I believe that the name is a representation. That's just now my opinion. Okay, I want to make sure I separate one thing from the other. Okay, so when we go back to Hebrews chapter, you know, one, and I'm finding it right over here. It says, from which, from, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? That's the language of adoption, like I said earlier. And again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Do your research. Go back and look it up in the, actually, it's right here. Samuel 7, 7, 14. He says, 2 Samuel 7, 14 says, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son for me, whom I will punish when he does wrong, and with the rod of men and with the blows of human beings. First Chronicles 17, 13 says, I myself will be a father to him, and he himself shall be a son to me. This is what we're told for Solomon. He was the king of Israel. He says, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And concerning the angels, he says, the one who makes his, wing, his angels wings, his servants of flame of fire, but concerning the son, okay, he's making a distinction between the regular angels and his son. He's saying, this is my representation. It's not like any other angel over there. He is different. He is exalted in a different way. He's going to have more authority than any single one of you. Okay? Said, but concerning the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Because of this, your God has anointed you with the olive oil of joy and more of a companion. This is an enthronement type language. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens of the works of your hand. They will perish, but you continue. And they will all become like all like the garment. Now, I want you to pay attention. I'm reading the whole chapter because I want you to see the sequence. Remember in John chapter 2, verse 16, 22. In John chapter 10, verse 14 to 18. When he's the good shepherd and he willingly gives his life voluntarily because of the commandment from the Father. Okay? I want you to keep that in mind. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit down at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool to your feet? He's quoting from Psalm 110, verse 11. And if you look at that expression through the Bible, it's going to be amazing how many, how many times you see it. Now, verse 14, watch this. Are they not all spirits engaged in special service? Talking about the regular angels. Sent on assignment for the sake of those who are going to inherit salvation. But then chapter 2 is going to give you the purpose, the function, and the role. Remember, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the representation of his glory. The Bible says that. Okay? So therefore, now, that's his role. He is doing the role of the image of God on the earth. Image bearer. Because of this, it is all the more necessary that we pay attention to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels was binding on every transgression and act of disobedience received a just penalty, how will we all escape if we neglect such uh, so, so great a salvation we had its beginning when it was spoken through the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard, while God was testifying at the same time by signs and wonders and various miracles, 
distributions of the Holy Spirit according to his will. In other words, he's telling you here that whatever Yeshua did, did it because God willed it. God says, I want you to go through this so that everyone will know whom you represent. You are my image. Okay. Now watch this. Verse 5. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, about which we are speaking. But someone testifies somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him, listen this, I want you to pay attention to this word, and I need your input here, guys. Okay? Okay? Okay, here we go. Who is like Elohim? That's what the word Ma Michael means. Who is like Elohim? Okay? And it says, listen to this verse 7, and I want to get your input here. You made him for a short time lower than the angels. Now, we already know. I already showed you evidence, even from rabbinical writings, that they believe that God already hid Messiah under his throne into the time. They, the, the writer called the pre-existent Messiah, who will defeat Satan and the enemies of this world. And we know that, okay? For a short time, you made him for a short time lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You subjected all things under his feet. Now, the question is this. For how, what's the reason why he made them for a short time lower than the angels? Can the angels die? They were creator. They're outside this time and space. Okay? So Yeshua willingly was able to come and says, I'm willing to experience death so that your name, O oh God, will be restored, so that your honor, O oh God, will be restored, so that the nations will bow down to you, my Lord. And then God says, because of your obedience, I will raise you up and put you in a position of honor and give you the name that is above every name. I say an enthronement language. The book of Zechariah says that Messiah will come put his feet on the Mount of Olives. And in the book of Zechariah, I don't remember exactly what it says. It, it says that his name shall be Adonai Sitkenu, the Lord our righteousness. He will be bearing the name of God. Okay, it says, you have made him for a short time lower than angels, than the angels. You crown him with glory and honor. You subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things, he let nothing that was not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. I want you to pay attention for the next three verses. Ten, the next five verses. But we see Yeshua for a short time. It mentions it twice. For a short time made lower than the angels. Because of the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. So that apart, so that apart from God, okay, or by the grace of God, he may taste death on behalf of everybody, on behalf of everyone. Function, purpose, and role. Guys, I need to ask you, and I need you to tell me. And I'm, I'm not going to continue until you give me the answer here. And I want you to be honest here on my on my on my chat. Is this making sense? Am I making something up? Or I'm just trying to follow the sequences of the storyline that what is telling me. Okay? Is it making sense? I mean, the Bible either, either is completely wrong, or sometimes we're just trying to not look at certain words or certain texts because it's uncomfortable and we don't have to have the conversation. Do I believe Yeshua is divine pre-existent from the beginning? Absolutely. He told me so. He was alongside the Father. I believe that 100%. I believe in Yeshua more today than I did 15 years ago. Believe it or not. Okay? For me to reject Messiah would mean that I have to reject my only way into the garden because God ordained him for that purpose. Okay? We need to allow ourselves. And it's uncomfortable when you want to learn something new. Don't believe me. Go back and look it up. Now, let's read this again. Verse 8 all the way. It says, For in subjecting all things, he left nothing that was not subject to him. For now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we see Yeshua, For a short time made lower than the angels, and he tells you the reason, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, 
so that apart from God, he may taste death on behalf of everyone. For it was fitting for him to whom are all things and through whom all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the originator of their salvation through sufferings. For both the one who sanctifies, how we sanctified, we're no longer in the realm of death. He promised eternal life. God already says, if you believe I resurrected my son, you shall be safe. Because now you're saying that the God of Israel is the only one who has dominion over creation, over life and death. Not, not the emperor and not Satan. Watch. It says, For both the one who sanctifies and the one who are sanctified are all from one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing in praise of you. And again, I will, I will trust in you. And again, behold, I and the children of God has given me, and the children of God has given me. Now, pay attention, verse 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in blood and flesh, since the children share in blood and flesh, and flesh, he, Yeshua, also in like manner shared in the same thing, same things, in order, what's the purpose? In order that through death, he could destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and could set free, purpose, set free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery throughout all their lives. Did that make sense? So now we have the purpose and we understand why Yeshua had to die. Now, we're not talking about his identity. We're talking about his purpose, his role, and his function. Okay, now that we talked about that, now that we connected those things, okay, let's look at every verse. Let's look at every verse where it talks about the resurrection. Who will resurrect Yeshua? Now, again, now we understand why Yeshua needed to be resurrected. Is that making better sense now? Why Yeshua needed to be resurrected? By the way, let, let, let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. I don't know if I read that already. But let's look at Romans Romans 8. Check this out. You need to be patient with me. I have to deal with a whole bunch of stuff this weekend. <laughs> you can call me heretic. <laughs> and I'm just trying to share the word. <laughs> and it's okay. It just it, it, we need to continue to prove the word and you know to deal in this stuff and this part of the process. Let's go to chapter eight, verse thirty-two. And you you need to go back and read the whole chapter. Okay, I'm only, for the sake of time. I'm only going to these verses. It says, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Conformed. What is that word in Greek? Let's look at. It. Let's look that up. What is that word in Greek? Okay, conformed. The word is conformed to outward appearance, shape, having the same shape, similar in form or appearance. Are you getting the are you getting the picture? It continually tells you the same thing. Let me go back here again. It says, because those who he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, these he also called. And those whom he called, these he also justified. And those whom he justified, these he also glorified. Verse 31 to 34. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Indeed. He who did not spare, who's he here? Put it in the chat, guys. Who is, verse 32, who is he in this verse? The son of the father. Okay. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. So the whole death and resurrection was the will of the father. So with all due respect, Yeshua did not resurrect himself because he came to fulfill the will of the father. 
And it says, but gave himself up for us. How will he not also, together with him, freely give us all things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Messiah is the one. Oh, listen to this. Messiah is the one who died. And more than that, who was raised who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So wait a minute, now he's a mediator? Don't we say that in the book of Hebrews, Yeshua is the high priest? Will not the high priest of Aaron submitted to God? So that means that if Yeshua did the role of the high priest, he's doing it to intercede and be a mediator between God and men. Exactly what Timothy says. We read that earlier. So one mediator between men and God, Yeshua the Messiah. Okay. Okay. So now let's read the verses. I read all the verses. Um, I read all these, and for the sake of the context, because this talk talks a little bit about different types of resurrection, I'm reading from the Collins uh, Thesaurus of the Bible. I'm using this on purpose because if I use Jewish sources or if I use something else, then people say I'm being Judaizer and I'm Jewish. So I'm using Christian scholars to tell us whether or not. Yeshua was resurrected by the Father or not. Okay? So in Acts 13, 37, for he, but he whom God, he, Yeshua, whom God raised up, did not experience decay. Romans chapter 6, verse 9, knowing that Messiah, because he has been raised from the dead, he was raised from the dead, is going to die no more. Death no longer being master over him. That's the issue. Defeating death. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. First, first Timothy chapter, uh, first Timothy chapter, um, second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. Talks about that. And there, okay, so Romans 10, 7. No, that's not the one I want to read. Romans 1, 4. Who was declared son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit by the by the resurrection from the dead of our Yeshua the Messiah. Okay? Let's go read that. Paul, slave of Yeshua the Messiah, called to be an apostle, set apart uh, for the gospel of God, which he promised previously through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, was declared the son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit by the resurrection from the dead of Yeshua, Messiah, our Lord, our Master. Okay, perfect. Let's continue. Now, Acts 2.24, God raised him up, having brought an end to the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So that means that the purpose of God sending Yeshua was so that his function would be the mediator and that humanity can see that man could live a life that is righteous and moral, so that God can resurrect him. That's the role of Messiah was to become the vehicle so that God's message can come forth. All right. Acts 3.15. And you, and, you, uh, and you killed the originator of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yeshua the Messiah, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man stands before you healthy. Acts 5.30. The God of our forefathers raised up Yeshua, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. Acts 10.40. God raised this up, this one up, right, this one on the third day. It's talking about Yeshua. God raised this one up on the third day and granted that he should become visible. Acts 13.30. But God raised him from the dead. I already read that for the purpose was to make sure that God can bring forth and follow through and giving you life because the Torah cannot justify you, okay, in that aspect, okay? Acts 13, 34. But that he has raised him. But that he has raised him. Who is he and who is him? Can you guys help me? Who is him? And who is he? Who is he and who is him? The 
Are you guys participating? <laughs> I'm making you participate. Come on. Who is he in this verse? It was. It's quite clear, I think. Are you guys still with me? Anybody watching? Okay. That he has raised him from the dead, no more going to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the reliable divine decrees of David. He, in this topic here, is the father. Okay? Romans 4.24. But also for the sake of us, whom it is going to be credited, to those who believe in the one who raised Yeshua the Messiah from the dead. Let's go there. Let's go read uh, chapter 4. Verse 22, therefore, it was credited to him for righteousness, but it was not written for the sake of him alone that it was credited for him, but also for the sake of us whom it is going to be credited to those who believe in the one, believe in God, because the one here is God, who raised Yeshua, our master, from the dead, who was handed over on account of our trespasses and, and was raised up in the interest of our justification. The more I read this, the more clear it becomes. This is part of study. This is part of research. This is part of finding the evidence. That's all it is. Okay? And Galatians 1.1. 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor by men, but through Yeshua, through Yeshua Messiah and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. 1 Peter 1.22. Who through him are believing in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Acts 2.32 This Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Acts 3.26 God after he had raised him, raised up his servant. Wait a minute. So now it's saying Yeshua is the servant of God. That's what it says. Send him to you first to bless you by turning each of you back from your wickedness. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Messiah was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so also we may live in a new way of life. 2 Corinthians 4:14. 4, because we know that the one who raised Yeshua, the one is the Father, will also raise us up together with Yeshua and present us together with you. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Yeshua, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. There you go. So he's saying the great shepherd of the feet of the sheep, that's Yeshua, who willingly gave his life. So the father can restore it, so that the father will be so will be the father will be honored the way the king of the universe is supposed to be honored. And then we have First Corinthians fifteen four. You can read Romans chapter uh, eight. I already read that too. Colossians two twelve. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised together with him through the faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Philippians 3.10, so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to, to his death. Colossians 3.1, I think I already read that, no? No, I didn't. Therefore, if you have been raised together with Messiah, seeking the things above where Messiah is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Have I tried to do the best to prove the evidence today about resurrection? For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, thus also God will bring those who have fallen asleep through Yeshua together with him. Guys, you know, I think that when we study this stuff and we search out things, and sometimes certain things are challenged. And it's always when you hear for the first time, you go, no, that cannot be. But 
no one is minimizing Yeshua or his role or who's his identity or or whatever people want to call him. But there's a purpose and there's a function and there's a role. Uh, in the conversation, I posted this verse and I actually got pushback from this verse. And I got to be honest, it kind of surprised me. It surprised me and it concerned me deeply. Because we've always confessed, we've always taught this. That if you confess with your mouth that the that the Lord Yeshua, with your mouth, the Lord Yeshua, the word there is kurios, means master. Okay? It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have we stopped believing that? There's something shift now that we have to justify that that's not true. It is a confession. If we are now come to the point that we have to justify that this may not be true, that Yeshua resurrected himself, which as we saw earlier, if he did not give it voluntarily, he could have done so. But he was made lower than the angels for a time. Just so that this will come true. Just so that the name of God will be exalted. So that he can become the witness for us. So that we can now have access to the garden. So that he can become the last Adam. So that now we all be partakers of the full restoration. So death will be defeated. But it clearly says that if you confess with your mouth. That the Yeshua is Lord. is master. Kurios. And there's by the way there's this book. That teaches you about the context of kurios in the first century. Now, in the Septuagint, and Paul quoted the Septuagint. I've been reading about this for a week. It's incredible how it's used. Remember, the word kurios can mean master. Let me go. Let's look it up. It means master. Okay? And if you look into Greco-Roman culture, when Paul was writing this in Rome, the emperor was considered the kurios, the master. So in the Septuagint, Mean, the meaning of the word master, obviously, when the Jews did not want to pronounce a name, they didn't pronounce a name, so they use another word. So they use kurios as the master. It's like there's a prayer in the Sidur, Ribbono Shalom, master of the, of the world. Okay? Let's look here in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And then we look at the word kurios. The word kurios in the first century could be used in different ways. Property owners are called lords. Matthew 20, verse 8. Okay. Heads of a household were called lords. Mark 13, 35. Slave owners were called lord. Matthew 10, 24. Husbands are also called lord. Second, first Peter 3, 6. A son called his father Lord in Matthew 21, 30. The Roman emperors were called lords in Acts 25, 26. And the Roman authorities were called lords in Matthew 27, 63. Even in England and in Ireland, there are people who are called lords. They own land. Now, Yeshua in the, in the Torah and the prophets in the Septuagint and the Greek they gave that title to always God because he's the master of everything. And that he has made Yeshua, he has, he has exalted him like Philippians says. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. We're looking to all the verses and we're trying to figure it out. Listen, guys, again, I say, if I'm wrong in something, I'll change it. Not a problem. But how many verses have I shown today that really says Yeshua was resurrected by the Father. Guys, give me your feedback. How many verses did I show you that says that? Now, did the, did the explanation before reading the verses helps you? Because now we understand Yeshua gave freely, voluntarily. He submitted himself to do the will of the Father. To bring eternal life. How? Through obedience, through suffering, and death. And then God resurrected him so that the whole plan of God will be fulfilled to restore the last Adam, so the last Adam can restore humanity. Okay? So when you read Philippians, 
It says this. Think of this in yourselves, which was also a Messiah Yeshua, who, existing in the form of God, form, what is the word form? Morphe, shape. The word morphe means outward appearance, shape, having the same shape, similar in form or appearance to be conformed, shape, manifestation. In other words, it's a model, it's a copy, reproduction. It's exactly the same thing as Selim, like Adam. That's what the text says, guys. Don't, you know, that's what it says. Who existed in the form, it's talking about Yeshua, of God, did not consider being equal with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, exactly what it says in Hebrews. He became lower than the angels, and he came to the earth. He emptied himself by taking the form of, the form of a slave, the form, let's go back to the form, the same word, the shape. In other words, what slave? Who is a slave? We are, because we were slaves to sin. But he did not sin. But though he has to experience death, although he lived righteously and he lived morally, he's still subjected to, the, to sin, I mean to death, the penalty of that sin. Okay? By becoming likeness of people. What is the word likeness? Appearance, image, likeness, form. And being found in appearance like a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. It's telling you that he became obedient to the point of death. That is the death of the cross. Therefore, so God exalted him and graciously granted him the name above every name, so that the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow, and those in heaven and those on earth, and those on, uh, under the earth. Okay? Now watch. And every tongue confess that Yeshua, Messiah, is Master, Kurios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All of this is to the glory of the Father. So Yeshua did it all so that his Father can have all of the glory. So I pray that we can continue to do research. We can continue to understand these principles. And everything Yeshua did was to fulfill this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from their faces. And that occurs in Revelation 21. Verse 1 through 4, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. In the ancient world, ancient Near Eastern uh, history, the sea was connected with Yam, Yam, and Taimat, were the gods of chaos and death and the underworld. So therefore, there was no more sea, no more chaos, no more death. Verse 4 says it. It says, Then I, John, saw the, city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And remember, remember Yeshua is already ruling and reigning here for a thousand years. And then the new Jerusalem comes down. After what? And God will wipe away, away every tear from their eyes, and there should no more be death nor sorrow, nor crying, and there'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In other words, now God says death. That's the only reason why God can come to the earth, the Father, when there's no more death. That's why the temple is so important to study. The temple is a microcosm of what heaven or what the garden, which is heaven on earth, looks like. That's why lepers cannot go in. People with impurities cannot go in. No one connected with death can go into the temple. Why? To show you what the plan of God will be. To restore all of Israel and then the invitation to all the nations to come back to the garden. Death needed to be defeated. This is the reason why Yeshua could not die anywhere in the temple. It will be human sacrifice that's unacceptable. Okay? He died outside the temple in order for becoming the vehicle 
that through one man, all men die. Through one man, all men will be made alive. But that meant that Yeshua needed to live a perfect obedience in, in this world. He proved that it is possible to be faithful and loyal and be moral and still keep the commandments. And then God would justify us, vindicate us, and uh, resurrect us, which means that we are no longer accused of something that we were not part of. He brought a pardon, not only to Israel, but he brought a pardon to all of humanity. And it was Yeshua the Messiah and his willingness to humble himself and to become like you and I, although he comes from the heavenly realm, so that we can be now part of his kingdom. Do I believe in a pre-existing Messiah? Absolutely. Do I believe he believes in that he's, he's sitting on the right hand of God? Yes. Do I believe he's going to come back and rule and reign? Absolutely. Is he my master? Yes. Is he my Messiah? Yes. Is he all those things? Yes. And he submitted to his father so that you and I can be here today. So yes, I believe that the purpose, the function, and the role of the master plan of God was fulfilled in Yeshua and I believe based on the undeniable evidence that it was the Father who raised him up for the purpose to vindicate us all, to bring justification and purification, because the Torah itself cannot do it. That was not what the Torah was for. That was for something different. And if you continue with me in the book of Hebrews, now from chapter 3 to chapter all the way 13, is going to establish the case how Yeshua now becomes the mediator. And if he becomes a mediator, then that means that now he's doing the role and submitting unto the Father because a mediator, and he's at the right hand of the Father, he is now connecting heaven and earth. Through him now we have access to God, the Father. That's why we pray to the Father in his name. By no means that diminishes Yeshua in any way. If anything, it actually answers the questions of a hierarchy and a perfect kingdom and order of his kingdom and how he is obedient so that now we learn from him. Let us be imitators of Messiah. Amen. Shalom to all of you. Thank you so much for being here with me. I pray this was edifying. And if you still don't agree with me, that is okay. But at least we can have a conversation. But please do me a favor. Go back and look it up. Look up all these words. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you for your time. Shalom.